Welcome back. You're watching 101. We're speaking with award-winning writer and author Hanif Qureshi. Now, you were appointed a, a commander of the Order of the British Empire, a CBE, uh, in the 2008 New Year's Honours List. That must have been kind of poignantly uh, um, a defining moment for someone who's an Englishman bred and born and bred almost, as you put it. I was really pleased. I've been studying the papers on uh, New Year's Day for years, looking under the Ks, you know, <laughs> thinking there must be some mistake here. And I was really pleased, and I got the medal home, and it says on it, as, as you say, a forgotten empire. No finer causes, it seems to me, uh, than those. I'm really pleased. I'm really pleased to have been a writer, you know, and to, uh, to have written about stuff that seems important and to have made a living as a writer, you know, and I, and I consider the CBE to be, to be for that, you know. Uh, apart from that, what do you consider your, your real defining moments? I was thinking, that's a very interesting question, because I was thinking about that actually today. I was thinking, I'm glad I'm a writer. I was thinking when I was 14, I remember being at school in the English class, bored out of my mind, rather unhappy, and suddenly it occurred to me that I should be a writer. It came to me very, very clearly, and I could see the future then. I could think, I thought, I'm going to do that now. I've got a real purpose, I've got a direction, I've got some point, I've got a reason to live. I'm going to do that. Um, and it'll bring me, if I do it well, it'll bring me a lot of rewards. So I remember that moment and, and it defined my life, thinking that, you know. And I thought I've been a writer longer than I was not a writer. Um, and people respect writers. The, uh, writers have some sort of... Uh, <coughs> I don't know, gravitas or importance. They're artists. People like them. They want to hear them. They think they're intelligent. You know, and it, it's good to be thought about in that way. It's better to be thought about in that way than not to be thought about in that way. I have to say. We talked uh, at the beginning about uh, the autobiographical nature or the comments that you get, of course, um, because you write uh, with a, about a lot of stuff that, that people associate with your own life. And uh, your 1990 book, uh, The Buddha of Suburbia, um, was, which won a Whitbread Award you know, for its, uh, um, as a first novel. It, it was considered very autobiographical at that time. There was a lot of backlash as well, though. There's a downside to it, isn't there, when you, when you do associate yourself with the, the story in some way. Um, I think your father was very angry with that. And even your sister then came out very publicly, and she was very, you know, very um, sort of angry with the way you approached it. How do you, I mean, to what extent do you think about the, the consequences of when you write about something that may be perceived that way? Speaking's difficult. I mean, look at any country in the world. There are people in jail for speaking. There is always censorship. People are always afraid of certain words. And there are words that you can't say in, in, in some political systems. And there are some sentences you can't utter in families and there are lots of things you can't say to yourself so the whole world is in struggle as it were about what can be said what can't be said and what's the line where can you cross it and it's the things that can't be said or shouldn't be said that are always the most interesting because there's some danger you know attached to them so you know like kids who are always testing you well they want to know where the line is what transgression is when you're going to get angry when you're going to lose your temper so thinking about that um, has always interested me, and particularly with regard to my friend Rushdie, who had a fatwa put on him for the satanic verses, what can be said, what can't we say, um, what is respect, what is blasphemy, all these questions are fascinating. I think they're really interesting. Your uh, second novel, The Black Album, in 1995, uh, touched on something that was very interesting at the time. You'd mentioned it was about the, the development of fanaticism uh, coming out of religious fervor. Um, it's been recently made into a, a stage uh, production. When you look back, and that was a time which was pre-9-11, and it was a time when, you know, the, the, the environment for Muslims uh, was different too. Uh, it, uh, to what degree do you feel that what you were looking at then has, I mean, is still reflective of what's happening now, or has it really changed? After the fatwa against Rushdie uh, in 89, he was a mate of mine, still is, um, I started hanging around the mosques more than I'd ever done, and colleges near my house, meeting these young kids who were, I don't know, between the ages of, I don't know, 18 and 30, 18, 25. Um, and suddenly I became aware that, you know, when I was young, all the kids were hippies, but these kids were, were religious. And not only that, they wanted a religious world, and they were very fervent. They were like sort of young communists, very hard line, very puritanical. And I was fascinated by them. I couldn't understand, as it were, why you would want to be like this, because it seemed to me that if you were a kid, you wanted a, to be liberated rather than constrained by religion. So I hung around them, and I wrote this novel, The Black Album, and then a film called My Son, The Fanatic. And as you say, The Black Album's been, just been made into a play. 
but I had access to them in the early days. They spoke freely, they were naive, they were idealistic. They weren't hunt, being hunted down. Uh, they weren't seen as being terrorists then. They were idealists, they wanted to make a better world. They believed in this stuff. Um, it turned very, very dirty and nasty, as we all know. Um, but the Black Album and the play are attempts to kind of show how people move from being anti-racism to being Muslims, to seeing their identity as being Muslims. And that was a new thing, and it was very interesting, and I hope that book captures something about the early days of that, yeah. What, uh, what did you want to achieve with your book um, in 2004, My Ear at His, uh, at His Heart? Very lovely title, by the way, about your father. My Ear at His Heart is a book, is a memoir, really. And I found in my basement and then at my mother's house um, several novels by my dad. And it had never occurred to me to read the novels that he had written all through my life. He was in his room typing away, tapping away day after day, just as I am. You, you tend to handwrite, though, mostly, don't you? I do. I tend to, yeah. I prefer that. And Dad was tapping away on those big old typewriters so you could hear it right around the house. So finally, one day, I found all these books and I started to read them. And suddenly, I found that I was in India. I was in Bombay, and there was his dad, and there was his mum, and there were his brothers, and he was playing cricket. And suddenly you see, it's like a, suddenly finding these films of your parents, you suddenly see, you've got this vivid picture of your own father's childhood. Um, and I was fascinated by this. And then my uncle Omar Qureshi, who'd been, who was a, a journalist in Pakistan and a cricket commentator, um, and the manager of the Pakistan cricket team, had also written his autobiography. So I found all this writing about the Qureshis. And it made me think about writing and the questions you've asked me. What is writing? Why do people want to write? What can you say? What can't you say? Um, how do we become who we are? Um, so I wrote a book about the Quraishis and, and writing and why I was a writer. Who have been your mentors? Who have you looked up to? Well, my father taught me a lot about writing. Um, and then I met a man called Jeremy Trafford who worked for Anthony Blonde, who was an editor. Um, and he used to come to my house when I was 15, 16 and teach me to write. Really generous, kind thing to do. He taught me a lot about writing. He would just sit with me and, and go through my writing, my novels. Uh, and I learned a lot about writing from the directors I've worked with, actually. Uh, from Stephen Frears, who directed My Beautiful Laundra, Sammy and Rosie, Max Duffer Clark, who directed my early plays. All the directors you work with teach you a lot. Roger Michel, who directed Venus, The Mother and The Buddha of Suburbia, because they've got, to, they've got to get the actors to say these words, you know. So they're very aware of the value of a word, of what a character does, of how you tell a story. Um, I'm a writing teacher. I've, I've got a post at uh, Kingston where I'm a professor of creative writing, and I teach writing too. And there's a lot you can pass on, and there's a lot you can give to somebody else really quickly. Apart from the writing, you've done a fair amount of directing too. How did you take to that discipline? I'm no good at directing at all, really. I've got lots of friends who are directors, and they're really good at what they do. Um, directing is a public art. You stand in the middle of a film set, there's loads of people there, and they all go, what do you want, Gov? And you have to know, and you're in charge. You're like, um, you know, you're running the British Empire. Um, writers can't do that. Writers are very private. So it's a quite, it's a different thing. I really respect directors. And also directors are really good with the actors. Actors are quite difficult. Why am I doing this? Why do I have to stand there? Why am I saying this line? Doesn't it make me seem like a victim? You know, you've got to put up with the actors. Um, and know how to cast something. This is a great skill, a very important skill for a director. It's not really my thing, um, but it's good. I mean, other people direct my stuff and I write it. You know, there's a good separation of labor there. Is there any professional target you've set yourself that you're, you're working towards? Well, when I get up in the morning, I still make my coffee and I go to work. You know, and I want to write, I still want to write. I still want to learn how to write. I thought the other day, well, I'm past 50 now, but I'm still, uh, fascinated by this, and I still believe that I can be a better writer, actually. I mean, I may, may well be a worse writer now. People always say, oh, we like the early stuff, it's really funny, why do you have to write this serious stuff now? Um, but I still like to do it, I still want to do it, I'm still fascinated by it. Now, obviously, your, your body of work is going gonna, is gonna to be there as a legacy for you, but how would you like to be remembered? Um, I'd just like to, my children to rem and, and my girlfriend to... to, to 
but miss me, you know, and think he was really good fun to be around. He was a nice bloke. He was generous and he was kind and he told good jokes and he was good to be with rather than, you know, grumpy, miserable old man <laughs> that I can be at the same time. To have, yeah, to, to have been generous, to have been kind to other people, it seems to me to be more than enough. Hannah Crush, a real pleasure talking with you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, thank you, sir, for having me.